The scientific method was developed in the 17th century as a method of inquiry to acquire new knowledge or modify our existing understanding of natural phenomenon through a process of observation and experimentation. Empiricism is a core principle of the scientific method, which maintains that true knowledge is best achieved through sensory experience. This method of inquiry allows measurable results from experimentation to be analyzed with predicted results generated through observations of the natural world. While the details of the scientific method vary among the disciplines, the basic framework consists of observations resulting in the development of hypotheses, experimentation, measurements to test those hypotheses, and an analysis of results to support, reject, or help modify the hypotheses. Science is an interplay between deductive and inductive reasoning. Experimentation is principally based on deductive reasoning, which starts out with a general understanding of a phenomenon and examines the known possibilities, we call these hypotheses, using rules of logic to eliminate false truths in order to arrive at a specific conclusion. One example would be, all humans are animals, all animals are known as eukaryotes, all eukaryotes have cells containing a nucleus, therefore all human cells contain a nucleus. Inductive reasoning is the principle of logic directly opposite of deductive reasoning. Specific phenomenon infer general predictions. While science is primarily based on deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning does have its place. Observations of nature are very specific. Milk is white. It hurts when my finger gets slammed into a door. As observation of those specific phenomena on a mass, a researcher begins to emerge with a more general understanding of that phenomenon, which in turn results in the development of specific hypotheses. Once hypotheses are established, experimentation produces results to reject false hypotheses and support the other ones. As a collection of similar hypotheses are supported, inductive reasoning can be used to develop a scientific theory which can explain and make accurate predictions in a wider range of circumstances. The purpose of the experiment is to provide insight into the causation by manipulating an experimental variable, or sometimes variables, in order to validate or reject competing hypotheses. While the scope and scale of experiments vary widely within science, a well-designed scientific experiment has specific characteristics. An experiment must be repeatable. An experiment that cannot be repeated, cannot be verified, and simply is just an observation. This is the reason why questions like, how did life originate on Earth, are really out of the scope of science. We can't really design an experiment to repeat it. A good experiment also contains many replicates. Making a single observation of a phenomenon isn't an experiment, but just an observation. Hypothesis testing is conducted using statistics, which requires replicates. A replicate is the repetition of an experimental condition on different subjects in order to measure and account the variability within the groups being examined. Statistics also assume that replicates are representative of the population being studied, and preferably they are randomly selected. The whole purpose of an experiment is to impose a treatment on something and assess its effect. The treatment in an experiment, which is also known as the experimental variable, is the variable that scientists alter within the experiment. For example, if a study was comparing the effect of sugar consumption on exam scores, the experimental variable would be the sugar. It is the component of the experiment that differs between the groups. Replicates are assigned to a control group and one or more experimental groups, and the effect of the treatment is assessed. The control group is a random subset of the subjects to be examined that either do not receive the treatment or receive the standard treatment. In our example, it might not be advisable for a group of students to receive absolutely no sugar. In this case, they would receive the minimal dosage necessary. In contrast, an experimental group receives the experimental treatment. There typically may be several experimental groups, each receiving varying amounts of the treatment, in order to assess the effect of the treatment at different levels. So in our example, the experimental groups would be getting different amounts of sugar in order to assess the effect on exam scores. Ideally, all variables in the experiment are kept constant, except the treatment. 
While this isn't always possible, it is the gold standard of experimental design. If an effect of the treatment is found under such circumstances, much more weight is given towards the direct causation of the treatment. Let's look at two different types of experiments, controlled experiments versus natural experiments. Ideally, scientists conduct a controlled experiment in which two or sometimes more groups are established and receive exactly the same treatment except for the alteration of a single variable. That variable is known as the experimental variable. More than one experimental group is generated when a scientist wishes to determine the range of effects of an experimental variable at different concentrations. By constraining all parameters in the control group and the experimental group, or groups, but only changing a single parameter, the experimental variable, any measured variation between the groups can be inferred to be a function of the experimental variable. Typically, subjects within the control group receive a placebo, a simulated or ineffectual treatment. Drug trials are typically run as blind experiments in which the replicates are not aware if they're receiving the actual treatment, or drug in this case, or the placebo. Interestingly, many subjects within the control group of a blind study of drug trials actually receive a measurable response, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, from the placebo. This is known as the placebo effect. To measure the placebo effect, an additional control group known as the negative group may be assessed. In contrast, a positive control is a known effect from the experimental treatment used to confirm the validity of the measurements acquired. A negative control should provide support to the null hypothesis, indicating no effect between the measured phenomenon. Often, negative controls can be used to establish a baseline result or to subtract a background value from the test sample results. In a controlled experiment, the variable in which the inputs are purposefully manipulated is known as the independent variable whereas the variable expected to change based on the presence or absence of an experimental treatment is known as the dependent variable. Variables that are kept constant for the control and experimental groups are known as the control variable. For example, in a study that's measuring the effect of rabbit abundance in the presence or absence of wolves, the independent variable would be the presence or absence of wolves. In this example, the measured effect, or the dependent variable, is the abundance of rabbit population. Many students struggle to differentiate between independent and dependent variables. The easiest way is to complete this statement. Blank depends on blank. In our example, the abundance of rabbits depends on the presence or absence of wolves. If you complete the sentence and it makes sense, the former is the dependent variable while the latter is the independent variable. Another way to think about this is, what is the variable you're controlling? That's known as the independent variable. And which one are you expecting a response from the input? That is the dependent variable. Controlled experiments are sometimes prohibitive to sometimes even impossible. Consider a researcher analyzing the effect of rainfall on bird diversity in tropical islands. Rainfall can't be controlled at such a large scale and is required in a controlled experiment, leading the researcher to employ a natural experiment. Natural experiments are considered quasi-experiments as the manipulation of variables are outside of the researcher's control. In a natural experiment, researchers rely on observations of replicates exposed to a variety of experimental and control conditions and infer an effect. The experimental design of natural experiments seeks to select replicates that closely resemble each other as possible, but vary in preferably one factor. For example, a researcher would select tropical islands of approximately the same size, structure, and composition, but known to vary in precipitation amounts. Through careful selection of replicates, effects of the independent variable, in our case rainfall, on the dependent variable, for example bird diversity, can be analyzed. Obviously it's impossible to select islands that are exactly the same in every single way, there's always going to be some sort of variation in island size, distance from other islands, plant diversity, topography, and a bunch of other factors. Often, known variabilities are also included in a more complex statistical model to determine how all of these factors interact. However, as these models increase in complexity, their predictive power diminishes exponentially. Determining causation from correlation from natural experiments is challenging at best, and some would even argue impossible. Let's take a closer look at a natural experiment. Perhaps the largest scientific controversy of modern times is climate change. The earth is warming. This is an indisputable fact. 
The cause of global warming has been the source of contentious debate among scientists and politicians for decades. The root of this controversy is due to the fact that analyzing the causal factors of warming at a global scale is conducted as a natural experiment or mathematical model, as we don't have several replicate Earth-like planets to control. With that said, presently no national or international scientific organization disagrees with the hypothesis that global warming is human-caused. Moreover, nearly all scientists agree that greenhouse gases are the culprit. Ever since the birth of the Industrial Revolution, humans have been releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere at increasing rates. Average global temperature is highly correlated with atmospheric carbon dioxide, and at face value this is simply just an observation that doesn't imply causation. However, small-scale controlled experiments can actually help assist researchers to determine the causation. For example, an experimental design including groups of replicates or atmospheres in sealed containers with varying amounts of carbon dioxide could be exposed to the same amount of light energy. Any discrepancy in temperatures between the replicates could be attributed to the abundance of carbon dioxide. In this manner, natural experiments serve as observational studies in which larger scale hypotheses can be generated via inductive reasoning. Smaller scale controlled experiments test these assumptions using deductive reasoning in a controlled experiment and test those hypotheses. If observations of different approaches are equitable, then there is strong support for that causal effect. Once the experiment is completed, researchers need to test the hypotheses, and we do this with data analysis. And specifically, we do it with statistics. One of the first statistics that we look at are known as descriptive statistics. These define the observations. Descriptive statistics summarize two aspects regarding the distribution of the data that was found in the experiment, the central tendency and the variability. Central tendency is a measure of the distribution's central or most common value. The mean of the observed value, known as the sample mean, represents the mathematical average of the data and is calculated as the sum of observations divided by the total number of observations, known as the sample size. Where the mean is the calculated middle of the data, the median represents the observed value of the middle of the data. For example, in this data set, the median is 6. If you order the numbers, 6 is simply the middle value. Occasionally, a researcher is interested in the most common value. We call this the mode, rather than estimating the middle. In our data set, the mode is 7. It's the most numbers of observations in this data set. Analyzing the distribution of the data is necessary to determine the appropriate measure of central tendency. A mean is typically used when there's a large sample size and few outliers. These are extreme observations that might have some direct influence on what the mean actually is. Hypothesis testing of means typically assumes a normal distribution of data, commonly known as the bell-shaped curve, in which most observations are made surrounding the central value and become increasingly less frequent the further from that central value. When data are not normally distributed by that bell-shaped curve, the median is considered the better representation of a typical value. For example, analyses of income typically examine the median because income is typically skewed by the presence of extremely high and extremely low income values. Another descriptive statistic is variability. Variability is a measured deviation of the data from a central tendency and is also calculated in a variety of ways. The most common measure of variability used is standard deviation. A low standard deviation indicates a small variation in the data from the mean, whereas a high standard deviation indicates data are spread more across a larger range of values. The standard deviation is commonly used as a measure of statistical confidence. Low standard deviation indicates high confidence that the measured sample represents the population as a whole. For example, if you measured the height of several random people, would that represent the variability in height for the whole human race? Since standard deviation is inversely proportional to the sample size, the more measurements of height provide a smaller standard deviation. And what that means is the more measurements you take, the closer and closer you have to getting towards the actual mean.
And this is the reason that scientific experiments require replicates. Replicates serve to minimize the effect of standard deviation based on small sample sizes. If standard deviation is acceptably low, this tells us that the sample mean is very close to the actual mean. Descriptive statistics are useful in identifying typical observations and detecting extreme ones. For example, the mean height of adult men is 178 centimeters, with a standard deviation of 8 centimeters. Interpreting the mean alongside the standard deviation suggests that most adult men, actually 68% to be precise, will be 178 plus or minus 8 centimeters tall. In other words, 68% of men will be between 170 and 186 centimeters. Two standard deviations account for 95% of the variation within the population, also known as the 95% confidence interval. So 95% of adult men are between 178 plus or minus 16 centimeters tall. In other words, the 95% confidence interval for human male adult height is between 162 centimeters and 194 centimeters. Three standard deviations account for 99.7% of the variation. So nearly all adult men, 99.7% to be precise, are predicted to be between 146 and 202 centimeters. Anything beyond that is considered an outlier or an extreme observation. While descriptive statistics describes the nature of sampled observations, inferential statistics infers predictions of a larger population that the sample's based on. Experiments produce data. These are in turn used to conduct hypothesis testing to determine the probability of competing hypotheses. Hypothesis testing is a statistical inference that measures the relationship between the control and the experimental groups. The predictions of each hypothesis are compared to the observed phenomena and are typically examined with statistical analyses. If the observed phenomena violate the predictions of the hypothesis, the hypothesis is said to be rejected. If observations don't violate the predictions of the hypothesis, the hypothesis is said to be supported. In this case, some scientists prefer the terminology fail to be rejected in lieu of supporting a hypothesis. The reasoning behind this is that even though a hypothesis is supported in one experiment, it can be invalidated in further investigations. The main function of the experimentation is falsification of hypotheses, or disproving hypotheses, not proving them. In this manner, scientists are not revealing nature, but exposing nature by revealing what is not nature. If a difference between the groups is not found, the null model, or null hypothesis, is supported, indicating no relationship between the groups, and therefore no effect of the experimental treatment. If hypothesis testing detects a difference between the data sets, this infers that the experimental treatment has produced some effect on the dependent variable, supporting one of the alternative hypotheses. Additional analysis is conducted to quantify this effect, which can be used to make predictions for future experiments. To test the competing hypotheses, a researcher must identify a statistical test appropriate for the experimental design. There are many different statistical tests, which differ in their assumptions about the data being compared. For example, are the data continuous, like time? Or are they categorical, like males versus females? Once an appropriate statistical test is selected, descriptive statistics helps researchers identify a relevant test statistic. A common test statistic is mean or median or some measure of variance between groups. The observed values are used to calculate the test statistic which is then compared with the expected values of the test statistic under the null hypothesis by calculating the p-value. The p-value allows us to determine whether or not the test statistics, for example the means, of the two samples differ significantly. When you take a statistics class, you'll learn how the statistic is created, but for our purposes it's sufficient to be able to interpret this statistic without actually calculating it. The p-value is a probability ranging from 0 to 1 that infers whether or not the observed test statistics of two samples are likely to be different and not merely a product of chance.
In most biological studies, if the p-value is less than 0.05, we can state that there is, in fact, a statistical difference between those two populations. This is somewhat of an artificial cutoff, but it's one that's widely accepted in this field of study. The smaller the p-value is, the stronger the evidence against the null hypothesis and the higher likelihood that the test statistics actually differ and increasing the support for one of the alternative hypotheses. All right, let's try an example. Let's test this null hypothesis. There is no difference between maize completion times in mice that receive water and mice that receive coffee. In this experiment, mice would be selected and placed into two groups, one group given water and the other one given coffee. Mice would be allowed to complete an unknown maze with a food treat at the end, with the observations being the completion times. To test this hypothesis, we'd conduct an unpaired t-test, which compares the means of two data sets that are not directly related. And what I mean by that is mouse A that receives water doesn't really have any effect on mouse B that receives coffee in relationship to their completion times. Conducting an unpaired t-test allows the researcher to compare the variation along with the mean to support or reject the null hypothesis by predicting whether or not the observed means differ from each other significantly. While the process of calculating p-value is beyond the scope of this exercise, we can still interpret it. Revisiting the experiment analyzing maize completion rates between mice that receive water and mice that receive coffee, let's say that the p-value of the comparison of the means by that unpaired t-test was 0.07. Since the p is greater than 0.05, this indicates that there's no significant difference between the means of maize completion rates between the two groups, the control that received water and the experimental that received coffee. In this case, we would say that the null hypothesis was supported leading to the conclusion that there was no effect on the dependent variable, time, of the experimental treatment, coffee. Consider a different result. If P was 0.02, we can infer that there is a significant difference, since P is less than 0.05, in the completion times between mice receiving water and mice receiving coffee. When this result is found, the null hypothesis is rejected, and the alternative hypotheses can be examined. In this case, there are two alternative hypotheses. Number one, mice that receive coffee have faster maize completion rates. And the second one is mice that receive coffee have slower maize completion rates. Since the p-value indicates a difference between the means of the control and experimental group, the next step is to compare the means. If the mean for the experimental group is higher, then the first alternative hypothesis is supported, indicating consumption of coffee increases maize completion times. If the mean of the control is higher, the research concludes that coffee actually reduces maize completion times. While this may be true, a scientist must be careful to separate correlation from causation. Just because two things correlate doesn't mean that one actually causes the other. When one treatment does cause an effect, this is known as pure causation. X causes Y. Let's consider a supported alternative hypothesis. Higher temperatures increase chemical reaction rates. Determining pure causation is challenging, but growing support is provided by similar results from repeated controlled experiments. While pure causation is typically inferred in many scientific studies, a scientist should always consider the many different mechanisms that two variables may be correlated. The opposite of pure causation is known as reverse causation, and it is where a correlation is present because y causes x, rather than x causing y. An inference of reverse causation in our example would be higher chemical reaction rates increase temperature. If you've used hand warmers, those little plastic bags you break open and heat is generated, you've experienced the effect of chemical reactions generating heat. A third possibility is common causation, where x and y are both affected by a third variable, z. A classic example is that ice cream sales and drowning deaths are positively correlated. We know ice cream sales don't cause drownings. Rather, there's a third variable, temperature, that is positively associated with both variables, ice creams and drownings. Cyclic causation occurs when there's a feedback between variables under consideration. A classic biological example is the numbers of predators and prey are dependent upon each other. 
If the number of predators increase, the number of prey decreases. And if the number of prey decreases, the number of predators also decrease. If the number of prey increases, the number of predators also increases. Deconstructing these relationships is often very difficult. A different form of causation can also explain the correlation between variables. Indirect causation happens when X is correlated with Y, but the effect on Y is directly affected by another variable, Z, which in turn is also affected by X. Indirect causation is commonly found in community ecology. Suppose a researcher is concerned about the predator on an endangered species list. Considering the number of prey is too simplistic of an approach to adequately model predator population. Revisiting the predator-prey relationship, consider a third variable, plant biomass. Prey abundance is correlated with plant abundance. Therefore, the predator abundance can be predicted by calculating plant biomass. Occasionally, two variables are correlated simply by coincidence. In any given random statistical comparison, variables will correlate with each other 5% of the time, when the confidence interval is at 95%. This is the primary reason that repeating experiments is so important. While it is not uncommon to find correlations between random variables, additional investigations will be able to examine the validity of actual correlation. If many experiments show a correlation between unsuspecting variables, evidence emerges that a real correlation exists. For example, increasing autism rates in the United States are positively correlated with organic food sales. Clearly, there is no causation of organic food on autism. More likely, the detection of autism has refined at the same time as an increasing desire for people to eat organic food. It's purely coincidental. Proving causality has proven much more challenging than measuring correlation. Much has been written on the topic of causality from philosophers of ancient Greece to contemporary physicists studying the butterfly effect, a nonlinear feedback system where the smallest changes in the inputs can result in drastic changes in the output. Many philosophers, statisticians, and even scientists suggest that it's impossible to prove causality of any effect. We can only infer correlation. While this is technically true, a well-designed experiment seeks to minimize this uncertainty. If the results from the experiment support a hypothesis, confidence in the validity of the hypothesis enhances, but does not prove the hypothesis is actually true. Future experiments may reveal contrary results. For example, if a hypothesis is rejected during one experiment, it may be supported in subsequent experiments or vice versa. If the experiment is repeated a large number of times with the same result, the hypothesis may be validated by the larger scientific community. Yet, scientific hypotheses are never said to be proven because new data or alternative hypotheses may emerge to disprove previously supported hypotheses. And this happens all the time. But as a specific hypothesis is tested in many different ways by many different people, usually over a very long period of time, if that hypothesis becomes supported over and over and over and over again, and it begins to have a larger context, eventually you can have the development of a theory, which can be used to make much more general predictions.